This episode of Rookie Hunter is brought to you by the Wild Sheep Foundation. Adventures in sheep country can change your life. And as residents of BC, we're very fortunate to have three different species of sheep in our province. After attending the Wild Sheep Foundation's annual convention, Sheep Show, in Reno, Nevada, we got to see what conservation looks like firsthand. The Wild Sheep Foundation's ability to raise and put millions of dollars on the ground each year to keep these majestic animals on the mountaintops worldwide is unmatched. The Wild Sheep Family is a diverse group of people from all walks of life, and membership is open to anyone. Whether you're a seasoned pro, it's your first time on the mountain, or you just like to see sheep on the hillside, you can sign up and join today. Kelly and I are lifetime members, but you can become an annual member for just $45. You can also become a member of the Less Than One Club, which is the only club you want to get kicked out of. If you've never taken a North American or international ram, you can join us in the Less Than One Club for an extra $25. Plus, Less Than One Club membership also includes entry into a draw for three separate doll sheep hunts, which will be given away at Sheep Show in 2019. For more information on the Wild Sheep Foundation and to become a member, head over to thewildsheepfoundation.org. Hey, welcome to episode 87. Hope you guys are enjoying the holidays. Hope you're behaving yourself, being safe out there. This is our final episode of the year, and it's a compilation of hunting stories that we got from guests throughout the year. We always figure this is a nice way to end off the season, so hope you guys enjoy these stories. Please do, as always, support our sponsors, the Wild Sheep Foundation, and Sheep Show is coming up real quick, so we hope to see some of you guys down there. Also, North Arm Knives, you missed the holidays, but uh, there's no reason why you can't get something for yourself in the new year, northarmknives.com. If you want to do something nice for Kelly and I as a little Christmas holiday gift, you can head over to iTunes and leave us a nice little rating and review, throw up some stars and a comment on there. We read all that stuff and it helps us out. Let's get into this episode. Sit back, relax, crack a cold beer and enjoy episode 87 of Rookie Hunter. All right, Kelly. This is the third installment installment of our uh, marathon reporting session. You know, I was thinking while well, we took a little break here that these might not come out in the order that we recorded them in. No? We'll see. Okay. J- just keep that in mind as you listen. This is the third one, not the second one. So this has become a Christmas tradition. This is the second time we've done this. And what we like to do is share stories from uh, throughout the year and We've sort of made this a, a thing that we do with each guest is we ask them to share a hunting story with us and we never really know what we're going to get from them. So we've compiled all of our guests into this episode and uh, we didn't actually have a whole lot of guests this year. It's a lot of you and I. No, but we also wanted to kind of keep guests to- In person. In person, yeah. limit that phone call. Yeah. Just a couple- th- You know, the phone call is difficult because there's a delay and also the quality isn't good. Yeah. And it's just, you get, you get something better when you're actually sitting down with somebody. So, yeah. So anyways, that's what we were hoping to do more of in the year to come up here. But uh, should we just get right into these, Cal? Yep. So the first one, um, this is probably one of my favorite conversations from the year. I enjoy them all, but this one, especially uh, we talked, we talked to Mark at a time when I was struggling with conservation issues and some of our plans and stuff like that. And he helped me through a lot of stuff. So we're going to share his hunting story. Cal, what, uh, what did he get into on this one? Uh, so Mark talks a little bit about whether there's a bigger purpose out there. It's, it's more of a spiritual aspect. Is there a deeper meaning? Um, he, he mentions that he's been talking or reading about a lot of indigenous cultures and beliefs. Yeah. And, um, is there more to wildlife and nature? And to really think about that when you're out there, you know, I think this is really a deep story. Yeah. Here's Mark with his experiences related to his grandfather passing away and, and kind of the hunt that, you know, he, he felt that there was some dots being connected there. Cool. 
But Mark, I feel like we could probably talk for oh, six totally, hours here. Totally. So uh, the room's getting hotter by the minute too. There's no AC up here. So <laughs> we can start to wrap things up here. Oh, uh, totally. We, we gave you a heads up that we like to end off with a hunting story. So you with, can leave us with that. Well, a hunting story, sure. Yeah, so one of, one of the things I'm finding as I get older, um, being, you know, not that old to to some people, but I'll be, I think, 52 this year. Um, My whole philosophy and worldview of hunting and and wildlife are starting to change um, a a lot. And I've I've had experiences happen to me over my my lifetime um, hunting where you know, some, something happened while you're out there and you were just, th- this just feels really weird yeah. how this thing unfolded. Like, like I'm kind of talking like, like there's a bigger purpose of something that's, that's going on out there. Like there's more to wildlife and nature than just these biological units that are walking around out there. And I've started reading um, cause, cause these questions and these feelings have come up in my life and I've started doing a lot, buying a lot of books and reading about, um, like indigenous cultures mm. and their relationship to wildlife and, and, uh, you know, like Inuit in the Arctic and like things that they believed and yeah. rituals that they had. And, and, um, you know, I've started to, to really start to tap into kind of a more spiritual com- component to hunting. Like there's some things that are going on out there, yeah. you know, um, deeper meaning. And, you know, one of the things, one of the experiences I had kind of, you know, I was probably just in my my early 30s that um, took me a long time in my life to reflect back on, um, you know, and opening this this part of my my life up in relationship to, to hunting wildlife but it was uh it was later towards the end of November um and I was whitetail hunting um just close to my home because I'm lucky and I can just literally just leave my house and go back out behind and nice. be in be in great great country and I spent I like uh, I just hike I just park the truck and you just do these big loops and walks and ridges and all this kind of stuff and there's snow on the ground the snow was falling it's quiet it's just like it's just prime time whitetail hunting and I covered ground like lots of kilometers yeah. right and I couldn't even find a deer like not even the you know oh, there goes some white tails. And <laughs> it's like, you know, which happens 90% of the time there, you blow them out and you just see a white, a white tail or what, nothing, absolutely nothing. And I'm just like, my God, like what's, what's going on here, right? And, and um, so getting towards, you know, the, the middle of the afternoon, later in the day, I moved, went to a different location and I started going in on this little, little old road, still hadn't really seen anything. And... I just happened to look down in the thick trees in the bottom and I just saw a flicker. This kind of, you know, something flicker in the trees and I'm kind of like, okay. And so I, I got down and I kind of like waited and this nice, big, mature five-point buck just hmm. nose to the ground, just stepped out of the trees onto this old road in front of me and and um, I was ready and, you know, and, and, and I got him. Just prior to that hunting season, like the winter before, um, my grandfather had passed away. Mm. And my grandfather and I um, were extremely close. I mean, we could sit and have these long conversations about, it was, it was the core of who he was, like about hunting and stuff. I probably spent most of my, my life, you know, hunting with my grandfather and, and stuff. And when I got that deer, I was overwhelmed with a feeling that my grandfather was there with mm. me. And, um, and I never felt it after that day. I never felt his presence when I was, when I was out, in, right. out in the woods. And 
later on I've had I've had other experiences which are which are starting to kind of get into the realm where I feel like <clears throat> that the animal is being guided to me or I'm being told this is the animal you are meant hmm. to harvest and that's why the situation is working out so perfectly right. like I don't know if you've ever had those experiences where like everything you're doing and it's not clicking and then all of a sudden you're just like this is picture perfect, yeah. you know, and it's this beautiful scene and everything is perfect. Yeah. So I'm starting to now be more open to the fact that that's because it's meant to be. Right. And when I've opened up this spiritual aspect of, of my hunting relationship out there, I reflected, I've reflected a lot back on that experience with that deer and that feeling of my grandfather. Mm. And you know, I think I toyed this idea around in my brain going, I think this is what actually happened that day, but I, I was never really able to like admit to myself that I think this is what actually happened. Um, but what I actually believed happened that day is because of my grandfather's connection was so deep for so long in his life to do with wildlife and hunting, when he passed on, he showed up to me in the form of that deer. Hmm. Hmm. And when he brought himself to me, um, partly because that was the only animal I got that fall. It was the only meat that I put in the freezer. And it was the only living thing I saw all that day right. was that one buck, which is pretty strange in the Kootenays, yeah. not to see any white tailed deer. Yeah. Um, but what I actually come to believe in my heart today is that experience was was witnessing my grandfather going on. Yeah. It's a great and, story. And, you know, once once I kind of really felt in my heart, like, I mean, that's because that, that happened like 25, 30 years ago, that um, I now really see the animal world, my hunting and what happens with the animals that I take, like completely different. Right. And I feel there's much more uh, meaning and, and purpose like purpose behind what and when I when I do something that's just beyond a hunter getting a biological unit and canceling a tag. Right? Yeah. Like it was a, I mean, it's a, you can probably hear it in my voice a little bit, but it's it's a pretty emotional emotional thing for me to you know kind of talk about and stuff. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, it's it's a one of the most profound and and powerful things that have ever happened yeah. to me hunting. Next up, we got uh, our friend Mike Hawkridge from uh, episode 54. This is a pretty intense story, actually. Yeah. I mean, we don't want to give too much of it away. Yeah. Sure. But just, you know, at the end of the day, Mike's a farmer. Yeah. And he's, he's got to protect his lands, too. And, and he's and, living uh, <laughs> in an area with a lot of wolves. <laughs> yeah, I think one of them surprised him. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's not say anything else. Let's just jump right into this one. Okay. So what had happened was I was out, I wasn't even um, really hunting at the time, I was out feeding cows, and um, while I did, I could hear one lone wolf uh, in the distance, and, and um, so I thought, well, once I was done feeding cows, I'd maybe go and talk to this thing, and, and I, I do quite a lot of that, and it's not that difficult. It's not, it's not that difficult to, to, uh, to talk to wolves. Mm -hmm. um, they might sound mystical, but if you can just kind of mimic um, not not all their high pitchy stuff, but just kind of a, a long mournful howl, you can actually get a lot done with it. And uh, so when I was when I was done feeding, um, I, uh, I I just kind of walked away from the ranch and walked up kind of this open fir side hill, just up off the base of the hill by you know a few yards. Um, and the the wolf was probably. I would say it was a good mile away um, and over to my right and slightly above me. And uh, so I started to howl and and it howled back a couple of times. So I knew it at least heard me and, and uh, I, I'd wait and, and remain patient. And then it covered some ground coming back my direction. Um, so when it howled again, I could tell it was kind of trying to locate. So I, you know, I would, I would howl. And, and um, so anyway, um, it this continued for probably about a good 15, 20 minutes. And, and, uh, there would be some times where it was pretty quiet. And then finally it would, you know, throw a locator call again. 
so it got to the point where up above me, um, so if you want to kind of picture the hill, uh, we're in big open fur country. Uh, so there's no underbrush or anything. And, uh, it's, it is winter time. There's a bit of snow and, um, uh, of course that's why I was feeding. And, and so up above the, the hill, there's kind of a ridge line that, that goes up above me and ends at about 80 yards. Uh, then the hill continues on past there, but there's this kind of this little ridge in front of me, kind of this, this, uh, little hill. And then it tops out at probably about 80 yards. And the wolf seemed to kind of come into the back of that and I could hear it back there because it was whimpering hmm. and it was whimpering like a pup. And, uh, so anyway, I thought, wow, okay, well it's, it's a young one. And I didn't figure I was going to get much of a shot. Um, and, uh, keep in mind, we, we use these opportunities because any of the ranching that I've ever done, except for current right now has been remote, like very remote where, where predators are a constant, something that we, we end up having to deal with, um, especially when it comes to, to cattle and calving. And so if you, you know, if you get an opportunity, you usually act on it. So anyway, up above me, he's, he's whimpering and he would whimper right, right in front of me and then kind of over to the left. And then, and then he seemed to kind of move back. Um, and it sounded like a pup. And so I thought, you know, I, I better slide a shell in here. Cause what's going to happen is he's just going to peek up. And if I have too much movement, he's gone. Um, but he continued to kind of whimper. Um, they did howl, or it, sorry, it, at the time I thought it was one, howled right at, behind the hill at about 80 yards. So at that point I thought, okay, we got her. Um, and um, But that's when the whimpering kind of started. And uh, almost excited whimpering, which was really odd. And so I thought, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my head face downhill and, and howl almost as though I, I'm, I'm leaving almost as I'm going. And, and I realized that, you know, probably my opportunity was going to be a wolf just peeking over the top uh, at about 80 yards. Right. And uh, so I, I turned my head and I howled downhill. And by the time, and I wanted to make my movements fluid. Like I didn't want to just jerk my head around. Like I just right. you howl long and slow. And then I just kind of swung around and looked back. And when I looked back up, I had two wolves coming down at me Holy as shit. hard as they could <laughs> two straight on and one from the side Wow, as hard as they could run. I had enough time, um, that I had my rifle almost sort of in the ready when I howled just because of the way I carried it. I swung up. Um, I didn't get an opportunity to even look down through the scope. It was too close. Um, the wolf was in the air when I fired. Jesus. My my bullet actually ran up its forearm and hit it in the shoulder. Wow. And uh, so I backed up. As I was backing away and trying to jack in another round, I was looking at the other ones because I didn't know what they were going to do. I could tell that this one was hit. Um but the other ones gathered themselves as I jacked in another round. This one was still very alive. So on, upon the second shot, because, you know, it wasn't going down. Um, wow. On the second shot, um, I hit it again, and it acted like it didn't even react because it was just kind of through the ribcage. Um, I, I knew I hit it because it, I was, it was right there. It was a few feet away. The other two at that point had stopped and they had then the one that came in left headed left and the one that came in from the front had turned and gone left as well. I quickly jacked in another round, hit it again the third time, flopped it over on its side. Even at that point, it reached over and the, the original leg that I hit, it grabbed it in its mouth, uh, in its teeth and, uh, and lifted its head looking at me and still growling. Wow. Um, it was spraying blood out onto the snow and just, I mean, I, I don't. I don't want to make them into monsters or not. I think wolves are the greatest things on the planet. Right. I, mean, I really like them. I love that they're out there. But I'm telling you, at this moment, this thing stared at me. Obviously, it was hurting and obviously it was dying. But yeah, I didn't see any fear in its eyes. Wow! It was like, you know, come back here. That's nothing but a scratch. And uh, so I went to turn to walk away. Only at that point was I then hit um, with adrenaline, and that's when my knees kind of wanted to give out on me a bit because mm. I realized what had just happened. Um, I. I can still remember to this day thinking in my mind, there's no way this is happening. Like when I looked at those wolves coming at me, like this, it's impossible. And the, and the lead one was that real dark one, almost black, um, real dark. So it was almost a shadow. Like it was almost in my mind. It was almost a shadow. And, and, uh, and I just, I, I just remember thinking like, there's, there's no way this isn't, it can't be happening. Um, but then as it made that final jump, 
um, I was I was very fortunate enough to squeeze. Uh, I would not want to be in that position ever again because I don't know if I would react the same. But I was able to do it. Um, and you know, I I made it to the bottom of the hill. I had a little ranch hand. He looked like little Gabby Hayes. He had a little kind of a little kind of a stocky little dude with a little white beard and a funny shaped little cowboy hat. And uh, he goes walking up there, and he and he sees he sees the wolf, and he sees the tracks, and he sees the hits, and he goes, "Damn!" He said. There's people that can shoot 200 yards. Now, keep in mind, this is a little iron-sighted guy that wears some pretty thick glasses. <laughs> right. so 200 yards for him is a stretch. He goes, oh, boy. He said, there's people that can shoot 200 yards. He said, damn, there's people that can shoot 300 yards. But hot damn, that's some shooting. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, he was pretty excited. I was Holy still shit. trying to gather myself going, holy hell, what just happened? <laughs> um so, so yeah, the wolf is, uh, now, now I've got the wolf in my house. Um, but yeah, that's the way she went down. And to this day, I've talked to some different biologists and, and, and I completely, completely agree with them that in the very beginning of the interaction that I had with the wolves, they thought I was a wolf. My challenge is when they broke that hill on the run, um, I wasn't hiding behind anything. Right. I was, I wasn't even hiding behind a tree, nothing. I was standing there. Um, and maybe they didn't quite identify me. Um, I'm not sure, but they were coming, they were coming f- like as fast as a wolf can run and um, downhill towards me. There was never a break in their stride until I fired. Um, and I know thinking about it, if one of them had hit me, um, I probably would have toppled over. And before I could have ever thought of regaining myself, the other two would have been on me. Yeah. Right. Right. So Crazy. it's very possible it would have ended very differently. Maybe I would have been the first case of whatever. I don't know. Uh, uh, they just didn't have that opportunity. So geez. and uh, since I've I've used um, we've we've uh, held in quite a few wolves. Uh, we're pretty dang good at it. Um, and a lot of times they when they come in they come in as though they they want to kick some ass. So yeah. it's not a it's not a, a circumstance that you don't want to be prepared for. It's right. something that you kind of want to be set up for because they may howl at a tree line. And if you're in a little bit of a clearing, they may hold up there for a split second. But when they break the trees, typically it's going to be fairly quick. Hmm. Yeah. So, you had but a, it is a super cool, super, super cool thing. Yeah, It sounds like you had some Liam Neeson in you at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I never thought of that. Yeah. That's uh, that is true. Yeah. Next up, we got uh, Gray Thornton from the Wild Sheep Foundation. We did this recording up in a hotel in Kamloops. We always seem to be hanging out in uh, hotel rooms with with Gray. Well, he said the first thing that came to his mind was this hunt, which was an elk hunt, which you'll hear about. And um, at the end of the day, the importance was the friendship, the planning, and the experience, um, whether or not the hunt is a successful one. And I think that really speaks to why we hunt but also the fact that you know he could have pulled a story from one of his sheep hunts or whatever he decided to pull an elk hunt that was not even a successful one um to to tell us yeah so i thought that was pretty cool yeah let's get into it you know i've been i've been blessed of late with some pretty great sheep hunts but i'm not going to talk about a sheep hunt i'm going to talk about an elk hunt that i didn't get an elk and it was, um, I was, I was shoot in my 20s, uh, hunting Colorado public land um, with my hunting men, uh, mentor, Daryl Amble. And, um, you know, I'm a regular guy and with a regular income and, you know, often more month than money. And we would plan all year long for that elk hunt. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I mean, I'd say half the deal was just the planning. And, and then the other half was the drive out from California to Colorado, you know, and just the stories we'd tell and the camaraderie of that. And then, and then the other bit was the five days that we'd set up my wall tent and we'd cut wood and we'd lay in some wood and, you know, we'd scout. And, and then there was the elk season. And, you know, by the time the elk season got around, I mean, I, I think 75 to 80 percent of the real story had already happened. Mm-hmm. And Daryl's... Uh, Daryl's a big guy, and he and I would hunt together sometimes, and then hunt separately the other. But we had we were going up this one ridge, and we'd typically hike up before uh, before light uh, in the dark, and and we'd gotten up on this ridge the day before and didn't see anything, and 
And then Daryl said, well, I'm going to go another place. Why don't you go back up on that ridge? So I, I go back up on that ridge. Well, I'm hiking a little faster than, than we did the morning before, but I'd left at the same time. So I'm about ready to top out on this ridge, and I heard some sticks breaking and the like. Well, it's dark, but I could just see enough. And I busted into a herd of elk. <laughs> and, and I must have, you know, who knows how many. I mean, I could just see these kind of shadows going before me. And, you know, I had 50 to 75 to 100, I don't know, elk. I had the wind in my face. They didn't know I was here. They just had heard something. And they literally you know, busted out and then just slowly were walking by mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And this, this went on for, you know, it seemed to me forever. You know, I don't know, back then, it, five minutes, six minutes. And here I had, an, you know, an encounter with a herd of elk from five meters away that, you know, went over a span of five to six minutes. And I could smell them. I could hear them. You know, I could hear the little cows and mm-hmm. you know, little whistles. And, and, you know, of course, you know, in my, in my fantasy, I figured there must have been this monstrous six-point bull elk in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't see another elk that trip. Mm-hmm. And I went home. Drove home after, you know, a fabulous experience. Daryl didn't get an elk. I didn't get an elk. But there was, there was a hunting experience that I have told that story over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as Adam Jankey would say, it's beyond the kill. I mean, I didn't, yeah. I didn't take anything. But I had an experience that most anyone that doesn't hunt will never have in their life. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really, I think, the essence of hunting. It's, it's, it's why we're out there. So it was the friendship. It was the planning. It was the execution of the hunt. And, man, did I have a hunt. <laughs> Just didn't have a kill. It yeah, didn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Next up, we got Mr. Ben O'Brien from The Hunting Collective. This is uh, back from episode 57. Man, that seems like forever ago. What do we got in this one, Cal? Uh, so he brings us a story from when he was younger, 13, 14 years old. Um, first time he hunted alone and by alone, he means his dad was probably over the next ridge and, you know, kind of training Ben to, to hunt alone. Um, one of the quotes from this story is old enough to pull the trigger, but maybe not old enough to do the other things. Right. So let's hear what he has to say. right, let's do it. When I was a kid, I have to, I'll tell you, it's a gruesome one, but a good one. All right. One of the first times I ever hunted alone, and as we were talking earlier, I would, my dad and I would go to public land in Maryland and we would hike in probably half a mile or so on this trailhead. And then in, at the time we were just hunting with muzzle loaders, I had a 50 cal hawking, I believe, hatching round ball. Mm-hmm. And we would sit on each side of the trail. And that was my way of hunting alone. I mean, I could see my dad, but at, but at this point, I think I was 14 or 15. He would just go over the other side of the hill and, and go down the hill from where I was. And for me, not being able to see my dad was, um, was pretty important because now I was hunting alone for lack of a better term. And so I remember just taking like a little fold out seat and putting it beside this trail and sat there for about three hours in the morning in the snow and just freshly snowed until the snow kind of covered the ground completely. And I didn't move. I'm, I'm sure I took a nap. There was no cell phones at the time, so I wasn't looking at my phone. And I had my, I was just sitting there clutching my 50 cal with my little pouch of round balls and a couple of powder horns <laughs> ready to get, to shoot a doe. And, uh, Luckily enough for me, this doe, just, I remember being really quiet in the afternoon, the sun was starting to come out. And this doe, I think, was probably headed to her bed, and she just came walking down this trail in the snow, and about probably six inches of snow at that point, came walking down the trail next to me and stopped at about 50 yards. And being the youngster that I was with a big, long 50 cal rifle, I shot and shot her right in the spine hmm. and dropped her. And so now, here I am. Um, it was pretty windy that day, so I don't know that my dad heard the shot, but now here I am with a spine deer and a, and a patch and round ball muzzle letter. So I'm trying to wet the patch and get the round ball in the right place. I'm shaking like a leaf hmm. and a deer, uh, suffering in front of me and I'm 
having big trouble. So I, at some point in all this melee, I drop all my round balls into the snow. And so now I have a wounded deer and no ammunition. I'm searching around in the snow and I can't find anything. And I'm just all the, all the while kind of freaking out. And, uh, just at this time, luckily, another guy that was hunting just over the hill came walking down, and a guy I'd never met before was dressed in buckskins, and he also had a muzzleloader. So he he came walking in and said, "Son, you want me to finish her off?" And I said, "Please." I'm sure at this point I was shaking and looking pretty pretty meek. Hmm. And he uh, instead of just <laughs> shooting the shooting the deer, he jumped on the deer, jumped on her back, the redneck that he was, and took out a Bowie knife and almost sawed her head off. <laughs> so she was screaming. I was screaming. The deer was gurgling. Blood was going everywhere in the snow. And I was in complete shock uh, at that point. And he kind of got up, wiped, his knife, wiped off his knife, and, and shook my hand and said, congratulations, son. Is your dad around? I said, he's right over there. About that time, my dad came up over the hill. And this guy walked into the distance. Wow. And so that, that was the first time I ever hunted by myself. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> my, hunting career so i that, that goes to show you one that i was hunting in redneck territory for right. sure dude dude in buckskins with a bowie knife was not all that uncommon Jeez. and uh and i that has burned into my memory forever as as a little dude seeing, i don't doubt it yeah. seeing that um so i don't know if that story's too gruesome for for air but i just it, it's one that is burned in my memory just as something that would happen to a young lad that was old enough to pull the trigger, but maybe not old enough to do all the other things. Right. As a way of learning, it was good. Aaron and Jeff, uh, we had Jeff Lander in the studio with us. Aaron Snyder was over Skype. This one relates to hunting with a recurve um, mule deer specifically. And, um, you know, you'll hear, hear Aaron mention that this is, one of the most memorable hunts in his career. And if you know Aaron, he's gone on, you know, many hunts in BC and Colorado throughout North America. So I think it's, it's pretty cool to, to hear this one from both perspectives. Jeff is, is being the guide in the situation, mm-hmm. but also uh, Aaron in the mix and um, kind of hearing Jeff's perspective as he watched it all unfold. Yeah. Right. Pretty good accomplishment with a traditional style bow and hunt, right? So, yep. This one's from uh, episode 58. I got a question for Jeff because I've never asked you this. I shot that buck with my recurve. Tell me what's going on in your mind. Um, hmm. I, I knew that thing was dead, to be honest with you. I knew that, I don't know, there's a lot of times where you're out with people and you're not sure what's going to happen. And mostly if, if they're going to blast them out once, once we saw where they were bedded, once I saw that you knew where he was, um, I just sat back and watched and yeah, I, I knew that, uh, you were going to get, you know, you're going to get an arrow into him. Actually, I didn't see that buck. I saw the other, the one that was with him. I wasn't sure where your buck was, but, uh, I knew you knew it. So yeah, that doesn't happen very often though. Schneider. Where I sit back and when I see a guy come to full draw, usually they don't get to full draw because they blasted him out, hmm. or the buck stands and they're looking at him and you know they don't have their bow ready. But no, I knew he was he was going to get it, and uh, and then when he crossed the canyon, went up the other side, and I saw all the blood. I, yeah, it was pretty cool. <clears throat> and I yeah. was really admiring cool your haircut. I thought your haircut was just dead on, just perfect. <laughs> He looked like Sergeant Rock out there. Yeah. <laughs> Being in the the same position, but in your position in reverse, I know you know. Normally, I'm thinking a lot of different you know things or whatever. But the, I very rarely do I have somebody uh, you know behind me when I'm doing that. And it was you know with the recurve and and that, you know everything else. And so I never asked you. Um, you know, I never really asked you what the hell you were thinking when I went and dropped down into that hole to shoot that thing. Or not hole, I mean dropped up to the edge to shoot it. Um, I know what I was thinking when I shot, because um, the shot was average at best. But, um, I mean, it is what it is. We got it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was one of the more, well, I'd say that's probably the most memorable, you know, that and the elk with the recurve, but the most memorable um 
you know, moments or whatever in, in, in me and my hunting career, uh, things like that just don't happen very often. And I didn't realize at the time that there hasn't been that many deer killed up there with a traditional bow. So mm-hmm. once you told me that later on, that was even cooler. But, wow. um, well, I was yeah, shocked. Uh, yeah, I was... It, was, it was very, very important to me. You're, I mean, I thought, you know, most of the time the guys don't, we don't get shots in the beds very often because they're up against a bank and, and you have to wait till they stand up. So I guess I was, I was kind of surprised when I saw you come to full draw. So I'm like, Oh, you know, this thing must be bedded. And then when I saw where he was bedded, I mean, that just never happens. They're usually in a, like the other buck was buried up against the bank underneath that sage, but that one was out in the open. So yeah, I was probably a bit surprised. And I was also worried about, Brian across the way popping his head up. I actually was more concerned about <laughs> about Gritty uh making movement because he was in, in you know, his his uh dome was in full view. But he didn't move. He did it perfectly, but I was I was didn't want something like that to screw it up, which has happened I can't tell you how many times. Mm-hmm. So yeah. No, that was pretty cool. I'm glad I took pictures of it too. Yeah, yeah, I forgot you did that. Yeah, it was it was cool. I mean it you know, in in hunting, especially where I'm at, going back to to the traditional bow, um, you know, everybody hunts for different reasons and whatever, all that different shit. But I mean, for me, it's a lot cooler. I don't know, whatever. It's hard to explain, but it's with the traditional bow. I have to get closer. There's a lot of things I have to do different, and, and uh, it's not just that though. There's a lot of um, people I've run into, even though there's a lot of crusties in the traditional community. Um, there's a lot of people I've met in the traditional community that for, I don't, for whatever reason, have a longer lasting relationship or a more meaningful one, as weird as that sounds. And Jeff's definitely one of them. And so anytime, like for me to shoot that with Jeff was super cool. I mean, it wasn't like a 200 inch deer, it was a big deer, but how it all played out was pretty, pretty intense. And hopefully we'll have that happen again. All right, Mr. Bellman, we got one more story and this one's from Adam Foss. What do we got? So Adam did a Sitka blacktail hunt that was on the Haida Gwaii Islands up in BC. Um, and they had a close encounter with a black bear. Um, one of the guys that was with them, which I think was camera crew, yeah, was kind of shocked by the fact that they had this close encounter and whether it was a re- like, does this happen all the time yeah. kind of thing. And, and it speaks to, you know, what hunters experience and um, you never know what you're going to find out there. So mm-hmm. that's why we selected this story as one of our key stories for the year. Well, I just, just got back from Haida Gwaii. So I guess one story that pops in my mind, we were, um, yeah, we were sneaking around and we were trying to get in on these deer and we actually came up over our eyes and, and there was a pretty good sized black bear. And he was sitting there and, you know, he's maybe 40 yards away. Oh, that's kind of cool. And we're kind of looking at him and he was, um, yeah, he was sort of digging around and doing black bear things. And, oh, that's awesome. There's a golden eagle sitting up above the tree. Oh, nature, this is really cool. Um, And we were looking around and all of a sudden he just sort of was coming our way. He pops up, oh, stretches, pretty big boar. And now he's like eight yards away. (laughs) We're like, oh, okay, right on. And he's sniffing. Our wind's sort of blowing sideways to him. I think he kind of smells. And you know, bears kind of have poor eyesight, anyways. Yeah. But he's looking at us. He's not too concerned. And then we uh, hear some splashing, and we're like, "Oh, maybe there's another bear coming. That'd be kind of cool." And we look over, and this deer is swimming across this little lake, <laughs> just like forty yards away, and he's you know cruising up. And anyways, this bear comes a couple steps closer, and I'm with my buddy Ben and I was like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go shoot that buck and then we'll come back and deal with this black bear. He's like, okay, cool. <laughs> so I ran down there and the deer kind of walked up and shot him and he's sitting behind me. He's just taking pictures of the black bear and he swings his camera around, got some like really cool pictures of like me at full draw on this deer, you know, sort of out there in the rocks and, and uh, shoot the deer, turn around, look at him. This bear is sort of still coming along. And I kind of run back to him and, and I got both, I threw my bow down, I grabbed both bear sprays, knocked the safeties off. And I was like, holy, like, what's happening? He's like, I don't know. This bear was like coming, but I want to take pictures of you and this deer. And he's still right here. We're like, what do I do? He's a buddy of mine from Vancouver, spent lots of time outside with, but hasn't done a lot of hunting or anything. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so anyways, in a matter of 
you know, 20 seconds. We're hanging out with this black bear. It's coming closer. Golden eagles are flying around. This deer is there. We shoot the buck. We come back. Sort of scare this black bear off. We didn't really want to go anywhere. Um, I think those bears are used to a lot of free meals. Mm, yeah. Just because there's so much food in, in the ocean. And, uh, and yeah, and, and it kind of finally lumbers off. But um, this guy is my buddy Ben's one of my best friends in the world. He was just, like, does this happen all the time? Like you're just out there. This is like hunting, like animals and you're at close quarters. I'm like, well, not really. I mean, <laughs> not really at all. But uh, he thought that was pretty cool. And it's and, like, no, uh, that was actually a dangerous situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I couldn't tell, I couldn't figure this bear out. It was as if he, he was so, he was very chill. Mm-hmm. And I just don't know if they, I don't know. They don't, maybe they see a lot of people and they don't really care or mm-hmm. there's just no, like, there's no grizzly bears, obviously. So they don't right. really have any threats and he's a big boar and just kind of walking along. And yeah. so were you both in the open, like the bear and uh, your buddy there, or was he like kind of concealed somehow from this bear? Yeah, we were around, we were sitting on this big knob and mm-hmm. we came over and the bear was right tucked in behind this knob and he just, as he came around the knob, it was just revealing more and more of him. <laughs> and so, yeah, we were like tucked in and just sitting there, but um, we weren't really moving around or anything. And yeah, he just couldn't really figure us out or just didn't care. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, bears are, especially at close quarters sometimes. I don't know, you get close to a bear and they know, like how can they not know you're there? Yeah, yeah. But they don't really seem to care. I know of hunting in Alberta growing up, sitting in a tree stand, you know, you can bait, bears in Alberta and you sit over at um, bait in a tree stand mm-hmm. and they come in and they look at, and they look right at you and they go, okay. And they'll walk in and they'll grab some of the bait or whatever. And, you know, you see videos on YouTube stuff all the time of all these bear interactions or, or the younger ones will come up the tree. I've had that mm-hmm. before. They'll come up a tree and sort of sniff your boots and they're smart. Like they're very smart animals and they're, mm-hmm. they walk in the same footsteps in as they do out. And right. you can see them, you're, it's almost like a dog when you're, you know, the dog's on the welcome mat at home mm-hmm. and it's thinking about going across to the kitchen and knows, no, knows it's not supposed to be in the kitchen and it's like walking and looking at you and then reaches the <laughs> reaches the linoleum that they're not supposed to be on and then, hey, and then they kind of back up. But anyway, it's just this kind of a crazy chain of events that, um, yeah, the, the cool thing was having my buddy with me who was going, oh, geez, like, does this happen all the time? And sometimes you take, you go out, hunting with someone and have experiences like that. And you go, well, I don't know. I've been hunting however long, 15 or 20 or whatever years. And I've never had something like that happen where mm-hmm. there's a bear and there's a deer and then you shoot the deer and then you come back with the bear and then <laughs> you're sort of dealing with the deer and wondering where this bear is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, it was pretty cool. Well, Kelly, that's it for uh, the 2018 hunting season. But I got a little surprise for you. What's that? Well, I think this should be a Christmas tradition. One of my all-time favorite stories comes from Shane Mahoney. Oh, yeah. So we've mentioned this story. He was on last year's story. Yeah, yeah, he was for sure. So we've talked about this one a number of times. There's some cool elements to it. Uh, He kind of brings it all home in the last bit. So if you've heard this one, you're going to enjoy it again. If you haven't heard it, well, you're in for a little bit of a treat here. So Shane Mahoney is uh, an incredible storyteller. And this is going to be on every Christmas episode we do from here on out. Because I just like this one. (laughs) It's a new Rookie Hunter tradition. Yeah, the Shane Mahoney tradition. So here it is. Well, uh, I guess if I came up with a, a sort of a fictitious one of uh, a Newfoundland Sasquatch, that would probably go viral. But <laughs> I, don't have one. <laughs> I don't have one on that. Uh, I haven't really thought a lot about this, but in emerging from our discussion here today, um, I have had a lot of experiences, both hunting and, and not hunting, with animals of, all, of many different kinds, from polar bears to, to caribou to weasels to uh, hamsters. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and uh, a lot of them have been really uh, profoundly affecting. Um, but one I could share, I guess, with you that is not 
hunting, but it's related to this issue, I believe. Um, I was fortunate uh, for many years to uh, spend uh, the rutting season with woodland caribou for probably 20 years. Uh, I would also spend the calving seasons and winters, but the rutting seasons were especially spectacular for many, many reasons. Um, and um, I therefore was fortunate to witness many interactions between animals, male and female, and certainly witnessed some incredibly violent confrontations between males. Woodland caribou are, uh, in our context in Newfoundland, are harem-forming animals. In other words, males gather large groups of females, um, and there's a dominance hierarchy established uh, amongst the males. They don't breed on migration as the great tundra populations do, the migratory herds. Um, they're also built differently, and the formation of the rattlers are built in such a way that you can easily tell that instead of grappling with one another, they actually fight one another. Um, so one of the more spectacular circumstances was a morning that I, I left my camp and I walked. I was often by myself. Uh, I walked. It was in mid to late October. The rut was in high gear. It was a morning when, you know, the, the barren lands of Newfoundland had, you know, all the little flashes or shallow ponds and the bogs, which are innumerable, that they'd all gathered this uh, thin blue ice of early autumn uh, uh, onto themselves. Uh, the vegetation had all turned colors, of course, the siennas and the reds and the spectacular oranges and even blues uh, were there in the leaves. Um, and the caribou pop groups, of course, you could see them over long distances because the, the landscape was quite open with relatively little relief, although enough that a man could hide himself and, and move close to the animals. And uh, I was looking along a kind of a shallow, almost like a valley, but it was very, very shallow, and two small ridges that ran uh, along the edges. And on each ridge, I suddenly saw coming out of this very heavy morning fog, which can be almost suffocating there in the early morning before it burns off. Um, I saw these two groups of caribou emerging um, and eventually could see that each of them had a number of males with them. But in both groups, there was obviously a significant harem master, this, this massive big bull that was just absolutely spectacular. The black face and the bronzed antlers and the, the great capes, and the muscled necks and so on. And of course, fighting in these beasts is really predicated on the equality. You don't really fight anyone unless they're really equal to you. And if you're not equal to them, you run away. Uh, and so real fights only occur between those that are matched. And I saw these two group of animals suddenly see one another and I eventually saw the two males do what they normally do, is they start to move out beyond the periphery of the females that they are watching over, and they perform their displays. They bush thrash, so they walk up to a small juniper, and they rake its limbs with their antlers, and then they gather their hind legs together and pee on their hocks and rub them together and so on so that they smell wonderfully and they demonstrate, you know, that I am powerful, I am strong, and you should really leave me alone and leave the females I'm with alone. And eventually in this absolutely, this unbelievable theater of beauty, with this, these flashes frozen and the color emerging and the sun now beginning to burrow through and, 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 and digest, you know, consume this ground fog, these two big males suddenly began to approach. I knew there would be a significant fight. Now I am only 30 to 40 meters, probably, yeah, about 40 meters away from these animals at the time. And they, they come together and eventually, of course, they get close enough and close enough. And then what caribou do? They tip their heads, they tip their heads, they tip their heads, and they walk gently together until finally there is contact. And of course, when they connected, they exploded. 
right? And you had these two massive beasts turning and gouging and trying to do what caribou do in that circumstance, which is to break the neck of the opponent. It's not about pushing and pushing back so much as to entangle those antlers with all of those branches and tines, which caribou antlers are famous for, and twist the neck of the opponent. <laughs> and um, I was watching this, of course, you know, and the mud was flying and they were slipping and falling and breaking through this shelf ice and all of this. And finally, I could see that there was one animal slowly, slowly gaining power over, over the second individual. And the trick for these animals then, in the midst of these intense conflicts, is to break cleanly and run. But as one animal tried to disengage and managed to do so, he slipped. And when he slipped, his opponent came at him broadside and charged into him, and I could feel, hear the smacks. I could hear the bones breaking. You could feel this crushing sound of things that were happening inside the animal's body. And they kept doing this as this animal tried to disengage. And I watched this until finally he managed to break away. And suddenly, of course, bedlam ceases. Silence returns. The male that is victorious he turns and very laboriously and slowly walks back to the females. The other group of females look at the defeated stag and begin to drift towards the other company. And then I see the male that was damaged, that, that had been broadsided repeatedly, collapse. And he died. Wow. He died. <laughs> But what was most interesting was I eventually lost track of those animals and I was following them and following them. And I noticed the male, the big male that had won, he could not confront and, and, and deal with uh, the stags around him any longer. He was too exhausted. And while I left them that day, I returned to find him dead. Both stags eventually died in pursuit of what they sought. And I recounted this story, I recall now, to a meeting a long time ago where the Sierra Club was present and where a lot of hunting organizations were not pleased. And the point of the story, I guess, in this context is, you know, we can fight all we want over what we think is the prize. But in the end, it's about trying to preserve those experiences. Because not one in 50 million people, maybe not one in 100, 200, 400 million people, have ever experienced anything like I did that day. And I could never, ever have experienced anything like it if we had not found a way to work for wildlife a hundred years ago, because believe me, they would have all been gone. So it seems to me we're fighting over the wrong things. We ought to be fighting for them, not for our particular position about them. Now that's a beautiful way to end this, Shane. Eli, I think you love both of us kind of speechless here. We're both uh, in a trance here listening to that story, but uh, I think that's... Uh, amazing. It was an amazing experience. Yeah, I okay. loved them. And as I said, I was not hunting that day, just hunting to try to understand them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all. That's all I was looking for. And uh, this was fed up to me as a, a gift. Had I been living in another time, I would have said the gods gave it to me. Right. The wild gave it to me. They gave it to me. There it is, Kelly. That's it for the year. 2018 is in the books. Yeah, it's always a good story. Yeah. It's been a good year. Lots of good shit. Lots of, it's been a busy year. Lots of experiences. Lots of opportunities. Lots to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah, for sure.
So um, without going through a list of people, I think everybody knows who they are as far as guests and people who helped us out this year and uh, people we met and people who contributed to the show. I should mention Wild Sheep Foundation is obviously a big part of, you know, uh, what we're able to do, you know, throughout this year and, mm-hmm. and uh, a huge part of what we have planned for next year. Yeah. And of course, uh, North Arm Knives and um, yeah, of course, most importantly, you guys who listen to this thing. So mm-hmm. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And happy new year. Happy holidays. Happy new year, guys. We'll see you in 2019. Cheers. Cheers. This episode of Rookie Hunter was also brought to you by North Arm Knives. North Arm Knives are handcrafted and sold directly through a father and son team right here in British Columbia. Choose from a selection of outdoor knives, kitchen knives, and custom engravings from NorthArmKnives.com. They ship internationally and guarantee all of their work. Kelly and I have put their products to the ultimate test and give them our stamp of approval. Head over to NorthArmKnives.com. <laughs>